Biography Nao Amalai Bhikhu, born Osper John S. Moore, June 25, 1905 March 8, 1960, was a British Theravada Buddhist monk and translator of Pali literature. Biography Born in Cambridge, Ospert was the only child of biologist John Edmund Sherrick Moore and Heloise Moore, nay Salvin. He was named after Heloise's father, the naturalist Ospert Salvin. He studied modern languages at Exeter College, Oxford. He helped a friend to run an antiques shop before joining the army at the outbreak of World War II, joining the anti-aircraft regiment before being transferred to the Intelligence Corps Officer Cadet Training Camp. He was posted to a camp on the Isle of Man to help oversee Italian internees. In 1944 he was posted to Italy serving as an intelligence officer interrogating spies and saboteurs. During this period he discovered Buddhism via Julius Evola's The Doctrine of Awakening a Nietzschean Interpretation of Buddhism. This work had been translated by his friend Harold Edward Musson, also an intelligence officer serving in Italy. After the war Moore joined the Italian section of the BBC. Moore and Musson, who shared a flat in London, were quite disillusioned with their lives and left to Sri Lanka in 1949 to become Buddhist monks. On April 24, 1949 they received the novice, Samanara, ordination or going forth, Pavaja, from Nanatilika at the island Hermitage. In 1950 they received their bhikkhu ordination at Bahirarama Temple Colombo. Nanamali spent almost his entire monk life of 11 years at the island Hermitage. After having been taught the basics of Pali by Nianatilika Mahathera, Nanamali acquired a remarkable command of the Pali language and a wide knowledge of the canonical scriptures within a comparatively short time. He is remembered for his reliable translations from the Pali into English, mostly of abstruse texts such as the Netapakarana which are considered difficult to translate. He also wrote essays on aspects of Buddhism. By 1956 he had translated Visuddhimagga into English and got it published as The Path of Purification. He also compiled The Life of the Buddha, a reliable and popular biography of the Buddha based on authentic records in the Pali Canon. His notes with his philosophical thoughts were compiled by Nyanaponikathera and published as a thinker's notebook. His handwritten draft translation of the Mahihimanikaya was typed out after his death and edited by Bhikkhu Kantapalo, and partly published as a treasury of the Buddha's discourses and then edited again by Bhikkhu Bodhi and published as middle-length length discourse of the Buddha and published by Wisdom Publications in 1995. Other draft translations, edited and published after his death, are The Path of Discrimination, Padasam Hidamaga, and Dispeller of Delusion, Samahavinodhani. While on a pilgrimage he died suddenly due to heart failure at the hamlet of Viragama near Mahawa. His body was brought to Vihirarama temple in Colombo and cremated at a nearby cemetery. Translator's Preface Originally I made this translation for my own instruction because the only published version was then no longer obtainable. So it was not done with any intention at all of publication, but rather it grew together out of notes made on some of the book's passages. By the end of 1953 it had been completed, more or less, and put aside. Early in the following year a suggestion to publish it was put to me, and I eventually agreed, though not without a good deal of hesitation. Reasons for agreeing, however, seemed not entirely lacking. The only previous English version of this remarkable work had long been out of print. Justification too could in some degree be founded on the rather different angle from which this version is made. Over a year was then spent in typing out the manuscript during which time, and since, a good deal of revision has taken place, the intention of the revision being always to propitiate the demon of inaccuracy and at the same time to make the translation perspicuous and the translator inconspicuous. Had publication been delayed, it might well have been more polished. Nevertheless the work of polishing is probably endless. Somewhere a halt must be made. A guiding principle, the foremost, in fact, has throughout been avoidance of misrepresentation or distortion, for the ideal translation, which has yet to be made, should, 
like a looking glass, not discolor, or blur or warp the original which it reflects. Literalness, however, on the one hand and considerations of clarity and style on the other make irreconcilable claims on a translator, who has to choose and to compromise. Vindication of his choice is sometimes difficult. I have dealt at the end of the introduction with some particular problems. Not, however, with all of them or completely, for the space allotted to an introduction is limited. Much that is circumstantial has now changed since the Buddha discovered and made known his liberating doctrine 2,500 years ago, and likewise since this work was composed some nine centuries later. On the other hand, the truth he discovered has remained untouched by all that circumstantial change. Old cosmologies give place to new, but the questions of consciousness, of pain and death, of responsibility for acts, and of what should be looked to in the scale it values as the highest of all, remain. Reasons for the perennial freshness of the Buddhist teaching, of his handling of these questions, are several, but not least among them is its independence of any particular cosmology. Established as it is for its foundation on the self-evident insecurity of the human situation, the truth of suffering, the structure of the Four Noble Truths provides an unfailing standard of value, unique in its simplicity, its completeness, and its ethical purity, by means of which any situation can be assessed and a profitable choice made. Now I should like to make acknowledgments, as follows, to all those without whose help this translation would never have been begun, persisted with or completed. To the Venerable Neoitaloka Mahathera, from whom I first learned Pali, for his most kind consent to check the draft manuscript. However, Although he had actually read through the first two chapters, a long spell of illness unfortunately prevented him from continuing with this himself. To the Venerable Somathera for his unfailing assistance both in helping me to gain familiarity with the often difficult Pali idiom of the commentaries and to get something of the feel, as it were, from inside, of Pali literature against its Indian background. Failing that, no translation would ever have been made. I cannot tell how far I have been able to express any of it in the rendering. To the Venerable Nianaponika Thera, German pupil of the Venerable Neoitaloka Mahathera, for very kindly undertaking to check the whole manuscript in detail with the Venerable Neoitaloka Mahathera's German translation, I knowing no German. To all those with whom I have had discussions on the Dhamma, which have been many and have contributed to the clearing up of not a few unclear points. Lastly, and what is mentioned last bears its own special emphasis, it has been an act of singular merit on the part of Mr. A. Samej, of Colombo, to undertake to publish this translation. Island Hermitage Dodanjawa, Sri Lanka Neo Amalive Hikhu Visakamas, 2499, May, 1956 Introduction The Visudhimaga here rendered, is perhaps unique in the literature of the world. It systematically summarizes and interprets the teaching of the Buddha contained in the Pali Tipika, which is now recognized in Europe as the oldest and most authentic record of the Buddha's words. As the principal non-canonical authority of the Theravada, it forms the hub of a complete and coherent method of exegesis of the Tipika, using the Abhidhamma method as it is called and it sets out detailed practical instructions for developing purification of mind. Background and Main Facts The works of Baden Takariya Buddhagosa fill more than 30 volumes in the Pali Text Society's Latin script edition, but what is known of the writer himself is meager enough for a page or two to contain the bare facts. Before dealing with those facts, however, and in order that they may appear oriented, it is worthwhile first to digress a little by noting how Pali Literature falls naturally into three main historical periods. The early or classical period, which may be called the first period, begins with the Tipika itself in the 6th century BCE and ends with the Mylandupanha about five centuries later. These works, composed in India, were brought to Sri Lanka, where they were maintained in Pali but written about in Sinhalese. By the 1st century CE, Sanskrit, independently of the rise of Mahayana, 
or a vernacular had probably quite displaced Pali as the medium of study in all the Buddhist schools on the Indian mainland. Literary Activity In Sri Lanka declined and, it seems, fell into virtual abeyance between CE 150 and 350, as will appear below. The first Pali Renaissance was underway in Sri Lanka and South India by about 400 and was made viable by Bhattan Thakuriya Buddhaghosa. This can be called the middle period. Many of its principal figures were Indian. It developed in several centers in the South Indian mainland and spread to Burma, and it can be said to have lasted till about the 12th century. Meanwhile the renewed literary activity again declined in Sri Lanka till it was eclipsed by the Disastrous invasion of Magga in the 11th century. The Second Renaissance, or the Third Period as it may be termed, begins in the following century with Sri Lanka's recovery, coinciding more or less with major political changes in Burma. In Sri Lanka it lasted for several centuries and in Burma for much longer, though India about that time or soon after lost all forms of Buddhism. But this period does not concern the present purpose and is only sketched in for the sake of perspective. The recorded facts relating from the standpoint of Sri Lanka to the rise of the middle period are very few, and it is worthwhile tabling them. Why did Bhattan Thakuriya Buddhaghosa come to Sri Lanka? And why did his work become famous beyond the island's shores? The bare facts without some interpretation will hardly answer these questions. Certainly, any interpretation must be speculative, but if this is borne in mind, some attempt, without claim for originality, may perhaps be made on the following lines. Up till the reign of King Vaigamau Abya in the 1st century BCE the great monastery, founded by Azoka's son, the Arahant Mahinda, and hitherto without a rival for the royal favor, had preserved a reputation for the saintliness of its bhikkhus. The violent upsets in his reign followed by his founding of the Abhyagiri Monastery, its secession, and schism, changed the whole situation at home. Sensing insecurity, the great monastery took the precaution to commit the Tipiaka for the first time to writing, doing so in the provinces away from the king's presence. Now by about the end of the first century BCE, dates are very vague, with Sanskrit Buddhist literature just launching out upon its long era of magnificence, Sanskrit was on its way to become a language of international culture. In Sri Lanka the great monastery, already committed by tradition to strict orthodoxy based on Pali, had been confirmed in that attitude by the schism of its rival, which now began publicly to study the new ideas from India. In the first century BCE probably the influx of Sanskrit thought was still quite small, so that the great monastery could well maintain its name in Anuradhapura as the principal center of learning by developing its ancient Tapiaka commentaries in Sinhalese. This might account for the shift of emphasis from practice to scholarship in King Bhagamani's reign. Evidence shows great activity in this latter field throughout the first century BCE, and all this material was doubtless written down too. In the first century CE, Sanskrit Buddhism, Hinayana, and perhaps by then Mahayana, was growing rapidly and spreading abroad. The Abhyagiri Monastery would naturally have been busy studying and advocating some of these weighty developments while the great monastery had nothing new to offer, the rival was thus able, at some risk, to appear go-ahead and up-to-date while the old institution perhaps began to fall behind for want of new material, new inspiration, and international connections, because its studies being restricted to the orthodox presentation in the Sinhalese language, it had already done what it could in developing Tapiaka learning, on the mainland Theravada was doubtless deeper in the same predicament. Anyway we find that from the first century onwards its constructive scholarship dries up, and instead, with the reign of King Batika Abhya, BCE 20 CE 9, public wrangles begin to break out between the two monasteries. This scene indeed drags on, gradually worsening through the next three centuries, almost bare as they are of illuminating information. King Vasubha's reign, CE 66 110, seems to be the last mentioned in the commentaries as we have them now, from which it may be assumed that soon. Afterwards they were closed, or no longer kept up, 
nothing further being added. Perhaps the great monastery, now living only on its past, was itself getting infected with heresies. But without speculating on the immediate reasons that induced it to let its chain of teachers lapse and to cease adding to its body of Sinhalese learning, it is enough to note that the situation went on deteriorating, further complicated by intrigues, till in Mahasana's reign, CE 277-304, things came to a head. With the persecution of the great monastery given royal assent and the expulsion of its Pithas from the capital, the Abhyagiri monastery enjoyed nine years of triumph. But the ancient institution rallied its supporters in the southern provinces and the king repented. The Pithas returned and the king restored the buildings, which had been stripped to adorn the rival. Still, the great monastery must have foreseen, after this affair, that unless it could successfully compete with Sanskrit it had small hope of holding its position. With that the only course open was to launch a drive for the rehabilitation of Pali, a drive to bring the study of that language up to a standard fit to compete with the modern Sanskrit in the field of international Buddhist culture, by cultivating Pali at home and abroad it could assure its position at home. It was a revolutionary project, involving the displacement of Sinhalese by Pali as the language for the study and discussion of Buddhist teachings, and the founding of a school of Pali literary composition. Earlier it would doubtless have been impracticable, but the atmosphere had changed. Though various Sanskrit non-Mahayana sects are well known to have continued to flourish all over India, there is almost nothing to show the status of the Pali language there by now. Only the Mahavaza XXXVII.215 F quoted below suggests that the Theravada sect there had not only put aside but lost perhaps all of its old Nanpiyaka material dating from Azokas time.21 may guess that the pattern of things in Sri Lanka only echoed a process that had gone much further in India. But in the island of Sri Lanka the ancient body of learning, much of it pre asokan had been kept lying by as it were maturing in its two and a half centuries of neglect, and it had now acquired a new and great potential value due to the purity of its pedigree in contrast with the welter of new original thinking. Theravada centers of learning on the mainland were also doubtless much interested and themselves anxious for help in a repristinization. Point three, without such cooperation there was little hope of success. It is not known what was the first original poly composition in this period, but the Dipavisa, dealing with historical evidence, belongs here, for it ends with Mahasana's reign and is quoted in the Samantapasadika, and quite possibly the Vimitimaga, dealing with practice, see below, was another early attempt by the great monastery in this period, 4th CENT, to reassert its supremacy through original Pali literary composition, there will have been others 2.4 of course, much of this is very conjectural. Still it is plain enough that by 400 CE a movement had begun, not confined to Sri Lanka, and that the time was ripe for the crucial work, for a Pali recension of the Sinhalese commentaries with their unique tradition. Only the right personality, able to handle it competently, was yet lacking. That personality appeared in the first quarter of the 5th century. The Visuddhi Maga and its author Sources of information about that person fall into three groups. There are firstly the scraps contained in the prologues and epilogues to the works ascribed to him. Then there is the account given in the second part of the Sri Lankan chronicle, the Mahavisa or Cu Avisa as the part of it is often called, written in about the 13th 